Good morning, church. I hope you guys are all doing well and that you had a good week. Um, we want to welcome you to our online service this morning, and we hope and pray that you'll have a great time with us. Just before we go into worship, I just want to read to you from Psalm 100, verse 4 to 5, and it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for the space we have to come and worship you this morning. And once again, even though we have to do it from our homes and we miss gathering together in person, Father, we know that you are there, Father, in the midst of every household this morning. And I pray that every person will just experience your presence as we go into worship. Father, we thank you for being such a good father to us. And despite everything that's going on around us, Father, you remain good and you remain faithful. And I pray that that truth will just become a reality in every person's life this morning. We just lift you up. We glorify you. You are the only one who is worthy of all our praise this morning. And we just thank you for all that you have done and all that you will continue to do. All glory to you in this morning. We pray this in your precious and holy name. Amen.
Father, thank you that you have been such a good God. Thank you that you have been so close. Thank you that we can call you Father. Lord, I pray that you would forgive us in times that we have disrespected you or disobeyed you, my God. I pray that you would bring us back into your fold and cover us in the shadow of your wing and we may know your presence. I pray, Father, that you would forgive us our sins. I pray, Lord, that your mercy would be new to us and that your grace would remain sufficient. Thank you, Lord, that we can know that too. I pray, Father, for the service. I pray for Nick, my God. I pray that you would have your hand of love and wisdom over him. I pray, Father, that your word does not return void, but it encourages us to spring into action for your glory. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity um, just to be a son and daughter in your house um and thank you that you're good thank you that you are a good good god 
that you are able to do immeasurably more than we can ever imagine and hope for. We thank you, God, for your grace. In your name we pray. Amen. Hello and welcome. My name is Janique van der Merwe and I have got a few things that I would like you to note that's coming up in the life of our church. And it is firstly that we are so excited to announce that God has been um, so good and he's provided an interim building or an interim venue for us for the next couple of months. We will be meeting on the 20. 3rd of May, <laughs> on the 23rd of May at Stain City Capital Park in Block B on Erling Road. Now, it's going to be a little bit difficult for you to find it on Google Maps and um, Waze or whatever because it's quite a new development. But we encourage you to please drive to Stain City Capital Park and then if you see the Hippo Building, that will be Block A, which means we will be right next door. If you still have any other problems, please just phone into the church and there will be somebody to assist you. Now, it is a bittersweet day for us on the day because we would love you to come and see and we are so excited about the building, but it is also um, the farewell of Dirk and Lene and you know that they have served us and loved us with their talent um, over the last couple of years and so we are so sad, really, really so sad. Our friend, really so sad to um, lose them, um, but we will be saying goodbye to them. And so we encourage you to come down, come through, come down, come through, um, see the building, fellowship with family again. All COVID protocols will be in place, no mask, no entry, um, and come and say goodbye to Dirk and Lene. Um, we also, so I will not be there on the day. I'm so sad about that, but I'm also excited because I have the opportunity to preach at Hope Ridge in Ravonia. And so I will miss you guys on the day, but again, we encourage you to come. Um, we're also excited to announce that we have secured transport for anybody who is in need. So if you need a lift from um, Heron Bridge from the school um, to Capital Park, please, 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 would you also get in touch with Trish. It is so essential that you book because spaces are limited. Okay, so please, please get in touch with Trish at the office and let her know and we will see what we can do to assist. Now we have come to the part of our um, service, sorry, that we pray for our family of the week. And this week is the Simmons family. So please put your hands together. Well, not like this, but you know what I'm saying. Let's just pray. Dear God, sure, thank you that you are a God that covers a multitude of sins um, and that you're not phased by the small stuff. God, right now, I thank you so much that you uh, that you have brought this family into our family. Lord, we just pray for Milani in Jesus' name. We pray for um, protection and safety at school, God. We pray for her colleagues in Jesus' name. We pray that she would be the light wherever she is, my God, that whoever may see her and know her may know and feel and experience you. And Lord, we just bring Steve before you in Jesus' name. We thank you so much, God, for giving him wisdom and knowledge on how to interact and work and deal with clients and people um, that shows your light and shows your grace, my God. I pray that you would give him wisdom, Father, and I pray that you would give him a vision on how to move forward and be strategic about how he brings about change in his workplace. Lord, I pray for protection for them in Jesus' name, that you would keep them healthy, my God. I pray, I pray Lord, that they are able to discern your word for their lives and your call on their lives in Jesus' name, that you would make their purpose clear, my God, and that they are able to walk in your way for eternity in Jesus' 
Jesus' name. I pray that you would draw them close to you as a family, my Lord, and just let them know, Lord, where you are and what it is that you would like them to be involved in. Thank you, God, for who they are in this church. And we so grateful, God, that we get to stand and join um, together and be united in the spirit as we pray for each other. We pray now that you would be with them this week. Um, cover them this week, my God. Give them grace this week, Lord, and show your mercy for their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, that's all from me. Enjoy the service. Morning, church. Last week, Andrew gave us a, some encouragement to join the relaunching of our community groups. And I want to add my voice to his in encouraging us to participate in what I think is such an important ministry in our church life. When I think about what community groups mean, and I've been involved in them for many years, it's an opportunity for us to get together and really share as Christians and dive more deeply into the word. If I think of the analogy of a sports team, um, a team that thinks that they can arrive on match day and, and win without having gone to the practices, uh, deceives themselves. And I think that we as Christians need as many opportunities as we can to, to practice in a supportive environment, to learn uh, more about the word, um, and to be more prepared when we go out into the world to live out our Christian walk. So I do encourage us to join in uh, wherever we can and uh, participate in community groups, whether it's leading or being a member of a group. Um, it's just not the same without you. We've got an obligation to one another to help to build each other up in faith. So please do give some serious thought to, to participating in this amazing ministry. And then this morning, it's that time where we... Uh, uh, give uh, thanks for the offering. So if you would just join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for every person in the church and all of us uh, who give so faithfully. We do pray, Lord, that we can have wisdom amongst our leaders as to how to best apply these finances for the effective extension of your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, for just continuing to bless and build our church helping us to be salt and light. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. You're hidden. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you. Your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. You're worthy of 
Good morning, everyone. A very, very warm welcome to you this morning and welcome to our service. It's really nice. It's great. It's wonderful to have you along this morning. Uh, I hope you haven't gotten too comfortable at home these past three weeks uh, because next week, as Janique mentioned, we are back in a building. Um, we really are grateful to Stain City for the temporary accommodation that they have provided. And I really want to encourage you to join us in the flesh next week. It will be our first service in our new temporary home. And so it will be good for you to see where we are and to see what God has provided for us. It is also Pentecost Sunday next week. And it is also our farewell to Lene and Dirk. It's their very last Sunday with us before they move down to Cape Town. So please come along um, so that you can personally thank them for their ministry and wish them well as they embark on the next part of their journey. We have a special service lined up next week and you don't want to miss it. So we'll see you there. Um, also, just to say the new venue is large so we can accommodate many people uh, with all the appropriate COVID-19 protocols in place. And we will be in Block B, Stain City Capital Park. If you drive into Stain City from William Nickel, there is a big traffic circle. If you go through that traffic circle, straight through it, uh, you will get to the main entrance of Stain City. At that circle, don't go straight to Stain City, but hang a right and uh, it will take you to Stain City Capital Park. And Block B is the very first building on your right. You can't miss it. Right, this morning we continue with our new sermon series on the book of Galatians. This series is called Only Jesus because the main purpose behind Paul's writing of this letter was that a religious Jewish group known as the Judaizers had infiltrated the churches that Paul had planted on his first missionary journey in southern Galatia. They were spreading a distorted gospel that required Gentiles to first become Jewish in order to then be followers of Christ. They had to become one of them in order to enjoy the benefits of salvation. So not only was this a distorted gospel, it was a false gospel that flew in the face of Paul's gospel, which was emphatically salvation by grace through faith. 
the Judaizers were saying Jesus plus circumcision and the law of Moses. Paul was saying only Jesus. 1,500 years later, Martin Luther would stand up against the Catholic Church and start the Protestant Reformation. And one of the things that he was protesting against was the selling of indulgences, a ticket to heaven. A teaching similar to that of the Judaizers in that it was denying the sufficiency, the power and the efficacy of the cross. And Martin Luther's rallying cry was an echo of Paul's 1,500 years earlier. Salvation by grace through faith alone. Only Jesus. Last week we looked at the introduction to the book and at the first five verses of chapter 1 where Paul lays out the main thrust of his argument that Jesus gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. In other words, to usher us into the age to come and into God's kingdom according to the will of God the Father. Let's pick up from there and continue our reading from Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which really is no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, If anybody is preaching a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. In Paul's day, the formal Greek letter writing practice or convention was to give thanks for the person you were writing to after you had done the greeting, the salutation. And in Paul's other letters, we see him do that. In Romans, Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, he always says something along the lines of, I always thank God for you. In this letter, we see something of the grief and the consternation and the agitation that Paul is feeling, because instead of thanking God for the Galatians, he launches with, I am astonished. In the Amplified Version, and I love this, it says, I am astonished and extremely irritated. I love it because I know that Paul, or I wasn't, I'm not the only person who gets extremely irritated. Paul says he was extremely irritated. And Paul goes on and he accuses them of being religious deserters and turncoats. And to add insult to injury in Paul's mind is that they turn to a different gospel so quickly. He had scarcely left them when they were already turning to a false gospel and a false teaching. And Paul sees this move, this turning to another gospel, not only as an intellectual shift, but as a desertion of God as revealed through Jesus Christ. He saw it as an abandoning of their personal relationship with God and as a rejection of God. And it is for this reason that Paul comes across as strongly and as harshly as he does. You see, this is not a minor issue. Paul is not writing to deal with some or other sin or contentious issue in the church that needs to be addressed. You know, in the scheme of things, sin is a minor issue. And I say that reservedly. Uh, Sin is a minor issue and Jesus is largely sympathetic to our sin problem. I mean, that is precisely why Jesus came to earth, to deal with our sin problem, to forgive us from our sins, to make it possible for our sins to be forgiven. And so our sin problem can be and has been dealt with. It is in Jesus' hands. But if we have a Jesus problem, then there literally is no hope. And the Jesus problem, which is in focus here, is a false gospel that denies the full power of Jesus and which limits the impact and the effectiveness of the cross. Make some mistakes in your life. Make some bad choices. Fall into sin. There is always hope because there is always grace and there is always forgiveness from even the worst sin and the most horrendous mistakes. You see, with Jesus, in and through Christ, 
Reconciliation is always on the table. It's always an option. But get Jesus wrong. Follow a false gospel or try to add something to what Jesus has done. In other words, reject the fullness and the sufficiency of the cross. And there literally is no hope. There can be no forgiveness, no reconciliation without Jesus and Jesus only. Friends, today we don't have Judaizers in the world anymore. I'm not aware of any group that insists on circumcision in order to be saved. But there are many other Jesus plus groups and teachings out there. Some groups say that without baptism you are not saved. Some insist that being saved means to have a special or an extra infilling of the Holy Spirit. And the only evidence of that filling is an ability to speak in tongues. And so therefore, speaking in tongues is seen as a requirement for salvation or as proof of salvation. In our modern era, it has become very politically incorrect and very insensitive to insist on Christ as the only way to salvation. The exclusiveness of Christianity is that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. And the minute that we as believers are silent as to the exclusiveness of Jesus, or the minute that we acknowledge that any other religion leads to God, then we are promoting a false gospel. For us as believers, this is tricky, and we need to be wise in how we relate to and speak about other religions. You see, we do believe that freedom of religion is necessary for a diverse society to live in peace. But as followers of Christ, we cannot infer that all religions are true just because tolerance is needed in a diverse society. We need to respect people's free choice and we need to defend their rights to worship who they choose in the manner they choose. But we cannot at the same time minimize the truth of the gospel by suggesting that these other faiths and beliefs are also the truth. There can be only one truth. It is absolute. Nor, however, can we insist that the whole world become Christian. Christianity cannot and should not be enforced by governments or politicians. You know, the greatest harm done to Christianity historically was not when countries outlawed Christianity and persecuted believers, but it was when Constantine in about 313 AD took over the role of patron of the Christian faith and made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. Today, still, we are dealing with some of the negative consequences of Constantine and his insistence that Christianity be the official faith of Rome. Insisting on Christian practices for non-believers like prayer in schools and insisting that Christian holidays like Christmas and Easter be celebrated and recognized by everyone is not the answer either. Nor is protesting against others who want recognition for their religions and their religious practices. So what if people want to make a special religious holiday for the ancestors? And so friends, we need incredible wisdom, grace and gentleness as we hold in tension the need to respect adherents of other faiths and their religious practices and beliefs, whilst holding on to our view that Jesus, and Jesus only, is the way and the truth and the life, and that no one gets to the Father except through Jesus Christ. To hold any other view is to promote a false gospel. And as Paul says in verse 7, a false gospel is no gospel at all. As I've said previously, the word gospel literally means good news. The minute we give the impression that there is some other way to God other than through Jesus only, it is incorrect. It is the wrong answer. It is a lie and it creates false hope and therefore immediately ceases to be good news. A lie, a wrong answer, something that creates false hope can never, ever be good news. And that is why Paul says it is no gospel at all. 
We may be tempted to allow others to believe something we know to be false because we don't want to offend them or hurt their feelings. But people who receive a false gospel and go through this life thinking that their sins are forgiven and that they are right with God because they have ticked someone else's boxes in an attempt to add to Jesus are on a path to destruction. This is so serious that Paul calls down a curse on anyone, even an angel, who presents a gospel other than salvation by grace through faith, as mediated through Jesus' death on the cross of Calvary. Paul feels so strongly about this that he repeats that curse twice in verse 8 and in verse 9. Now, we may feel tempted to call down curses and damnation on people like Paul does. But we live in a different era than Paul did. And despite cursing those who were preaching a different message, Paul's letter to Galatians does go on to focus on the freedom and the love that come from the Holy Spirit. And the lesson for us, whilst we are to be passionate about the truth and on fire for the gospel, is that we need to express ourselves in such a way that the glorious freedom of the gospel is not obscured and that God's great love for all people is not somehow hidden or diminished as we stand up for and defend what we believe to be true. You see, if we obscure the freedom of the gospel and diminish God's love, then we fail right at the very outset to convey the essence of the very gospel we are trying to defend and proclaim. One of the greatest challenges I have with the reformed hyper-conservative movements within Christianity is that in their zeal to be true to God's word and faithful to doctrine, they so often come across as very harsh, very critical, very judgmental, and very unloving. John MacArthur He falls into this category of conservatism, and he is the head of a very large ministry called Grace to You. Unfortunately, he very often comes across as the antithesis of grace. And my apologies to the MacArthurites out there. I believe that John MacArthur is a deeply godly man who is passionate for the truth of God's word. But I would caution that whilst we must be willing to confront We need to do so in a way that is consistent with the gospel and in a way that reveals the love and the grace and the mercy and the beauty of Jesus Christ. Let's go on now and look at verses 10 to 24 of chapter 1. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? If I was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my father's. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by His grace, was pleased to reveal His Son in me so that I might preach Him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later I returned to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praise God because of me. And so we see that the letter now takes on an autobiographical tone as Paul turns to the issue of the independence of the gospel that he proclaimed. And this is the theme through to the end of chapter 2. 
Paul starts by arguing that his gospel is independent of human teaching and also independent of the major churches in Judea. In those early days, Jerusalem was seen as the home and the heart of the Christian faith. Even though Jesus spent most of his ministry in Galilee, after his resurrection, the apostles were based in Jerusalem. And thus the early church authorities and the knowledge for the development of Christian thinking was centered there at Jerusalem. Jerusalem was seen as the seat of the early church. In much the same way that in later years, and even to the present day, the seat of the Catholic Church is seen to be the Vatican in Rome. From what Paul is saying, we can infer that his opponents, the Judaizers, were arguing that his gospel was from Jerusalem and the early Jewish apostles who were based there. By insisting on this and proving it, The Judaizers could then argue that they too represented Jerusalem, but that their gospel was the latest expression and that they could thus correct or modify and supplement Paul's gospel. They may possibly even have argued that Paul was presenting a watered down version of the gospel to make it more attractive to the Gentiles in Galatia. Either way, It was important for Paul's opponents to show that his gospel was handed down to him by the apostles in Jerusalem or from the major churches in Judea, and that he, Paul, either intentionally or accidentally had gotten it wrong in the transmission. And this is why it is so important for Paul, and he goes to great lengths to show that his gospel has not being handed down to him from the other apostles, either in Jerusalem or from the major churches in Judea, but that he received this gospel directly from God, independent of the apostles and church authorities. And he does so by starting with the assertion that his focus is God. He is not trying to please people or win their approval. Friends, It is good for us to continually evaluate whether we are seeking to gain the approval of men or of God. How much do we succumb to social pressure and peer pressure in the exercise of our faith journey? It's like the story told by theologian Stephen Roy of the superb young violinist who had a fear of large crowds and so avoided giving concerts. She was eventually convinced to give a concert at a large concert hall in London. So she went onto stage, sat down and without any music in front of her, played her violin for an hour and a half. The most beautiful violin music imaginable. When she finished, As one, the crowd rose to its feet and gave her wild and prolonged applause. But the young violinist did not acknowledge the applause. She just peered into the audience as if she was looking for someone, scanning their faces. Finally, she appeared to find whom she was looking for and relief came over her face and only then did she begin to acknowledge the rapturous applause that she was receiving. After the concert, critics met her backstage and she was asked why she had waited so long to acknowledge the applause. To which she replied, I was afraid of playing here, but knew it was something I needed to do. Tonight, just before I came onto stage, I received word that my master teacher was in the audience. Throughout the concert, I tried to look out for him, but I couldn't see him. When I finished playing, I looked even more intently. I was so eager to find him and to see his face that I didn't even hear the applause. All that mattered to me was what he thought of my performance. Finally, I saw him high up in the balcony. He was standing and he was applauding with a big smile on his face. At that point, I knew that I could relax. If the master is pleased with what I have done, then everything else is okay. Friends, we need to be deaf 
to the applause and the adoration and the adulation of the world. The only opinion which should matter to us is that of our Lord and our Master. That can be very challenging because we all crave affirmation and recognition. But all that counts, all that counts is the nod from Him and the words from Him, well done, my good and faithful servant. The converse also holds true. The comments, the criticism and rejection of the world means absolutely nothing in the pursuit of a life lived to please God. Well, Paul then goes on in verses 11 and 12 to state that the gospel he preached was not from man or of human origin, but was received directly from Jesus himself. It was a direct revelation from Jesus. He is most likely referring to his Damascus Road encounter with the risen Lord. And what is important is that Paul is saying this was a revelation it was revealed to him by Jesus Christ directly and as such is much more reliable and trustworthy than anything passed on to him or passed down to him by humans. And certainly much more trustworthy and reliable than the gospel being preached by the Judaizers, which had either been passed on to them by humans or was something that they had concocted themselves. For us today, that means that we can and we should place absolute faith and trust in the veracity and the accuracy of Paul's teaching. How can we doubt what Paul is telling us if what he is telling us is directly from the risen Christ? You see, Paul has pulled out the trump card. There can be no higher authority than what was revealed directly to him by Jesus Christ himself. And here, friends, I need to add a word of caution. I think we have all been in situations and in conversations and in debates where a well-meaning believer has said something along the lines of the Lord told me or the Lord showed me. That statement on the lips of any believer puts an end immediately to any further debate or conversation. Because how can we argue with the Lord? To argue with someone who says, God told me, is to call God a liar. And it is to say to the person, or it is to say to the person, listen, you're mistaken, God did not tell you. Either way, there's a confrontation. My response to someone who tells me that God told them is, how did God tell you? I want objective verification of God's direct revelation to them. I believe that God does speak to us today and he does reveal things to us. But we had better be very darn sure that we have heard right and that we are not putting words in God's mouth or simply imputing our ideas and our desires onto God. Because if we get that wrong, then we are making God a liar. I believe it is far safer to say, I think the Lord is telling me, or I think he is showing me. It is also very prudent to test these revelations from God by going back to the Bible and ensuring that what we think God is telling us aligns with the scriptures. This is also an area where we would do well to test and verify these things by seeking the wisdom and the counsel of other believers, older believers, more mature believers, and not necessarily our friends and contemporaries who may be tempted to tell us what we want to hear or don't want to hurt our feelings. Paul goes on then to remind his readers that he formerly was a persecutor of the church and that he was extremely zealous for the law and its Jewish distinctives. His description of his past focuses on the sacred traditions that were passed on in Judaism, the very thing that he is arguing against in this letter. And Paul then goes on in verse 18 to say that he did meet with Cephas, that is Peter, in Jerusalem, and also Jesus' brother James, who was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. But it wasn't to learn the gospel from them. His meeting with Peter and James 
happened briefly, three years after his, converse, uh, his conversion. And so the implication is that he can hardly be considered to be a Jerusalem apostle. After that, Paul says he went to Syria and Cilicia, but that he was personally unknown to the churches there. They only knew him by reputation. And so again, Paul is emphatically stating that he did not get his gospel from man, but directly from Jesus, thus emphasizing the fact that his gospel is the true gospel and the one being preached by the Judaizers is a distortion of the gospel and thus no gospel at all. Friends, there is more that we can tease out of this passage, but I'm going to stop there today. When we come back to Galatians chapter 2 on the 30th of May, we will see that Paul continues to establish his credentials as the true herald of the one true gospel. And then he starts to outline the implications of that gospel. Please do join us next week at Stain City and online for our Pentecost service and for our farewell to Dirk and Lene. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for this letter that Paul wrote. Lord, thank you that you revealed the gospel to Paul directly. Lord, thank you that there is no higher authority, no higher revelation than that which comes from you directly. And so, Lord, as we, as we learn from Paul, as we read Paul's letters, we have the, the assurance, the guarantee that this isn't something that was handed down by others, maybe mistakenly or erroneously, but this is teaching directly from you. And Lord, thank you that that teaching is that we are saved by grace through faith alone, that no one would boast, not by works. Lord, our, our salvation comes because of you and because of what you have done and you only. And Lord, as we, as we live by that gospel, may we just keep our eyes fixed firmly on you. Lord, forgive us for the times that we think that we can add anything to this gospel and somehow win your approval. It is only by grace. And Lord, help us as, as, we, as we journey, as we live this journey, to, to stand up for the truth of the gospel. Lord, give us boldness and courage, but also sensitivity and wisdom as we speak to those who are following a false gospel, a distorted gospel. Help us, Lord, to be winsome, to be as, as wise as serpents and as gentle as doves as we do that. And as we do that, Lord Jesus, I just pray that you would just make the power of your gospel visible through our lives. That as we respond to people, as we live between and among people, that they would see the, the, the joy and the grace and the beauty and the peace and the wholesomeness of Jesus shining through us. And may you be glorified as we do that. In Jesus' name, amen. You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. Hidden glory in creation now revealed in you, oh Christ. What a beautiful name it is! What a beautiful name it is! The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is! Nothing comes. To this, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you. Your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is! What a wonderful name it is! The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is! Nothing compares to.
to this What a wonderful name it is The name of Jesus What a wonderful name it is The name of Jesus Friend, that's, uh, that concludes our service this morning. Thank you so much again for joining us today. And thank you to everybody who made this service possible. Uh, please do make a plan to join us in the flesh at our new temporary home at Stain City next week. Same time, different place. And as you go out into the week ahead, may you be very, very aware of this incredible gospel mediated through God's grace. Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, that we have this treasure, this gospel of grace in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power, the power of salvation through Christ alone and the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ is from God and not from us. Be blessed as you go out into the week ahead. See you next week. Cheers. There's no one else above you, God. You're worthy of it all. So worthy of our praise this morning, Jesus. So we sing. Death could not hold you. The veil torn before you. Your silence the Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus.